I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to The Bigfoot Project. When I was 13, I had an encounter that I will never forget. I grew up in the country and have hunted everything possible in my area. I was in the woods every chance I could get all year round. Here's what happened. My parents' neighbor has hundreds of forested acres. My brother and I were friends with his son. We hunted his father's land constantly. The neighbor's son and my brother asked if we could build a log cabin in the backwoods. His father said, no problem. So, about five of us teenagers built a small cabin several miles back in the woods. It was roughly about 12 feet by 15 feet with a tin roof and a temporary plywood door that was too small. There was about an 8-inch gap at the top of it. If we weren't in school, we stayed in that cabin all year round, hunting and being kids, having fun. The cabin wasn't finished by any means, but was pretty good for kids building it. Between the logs, we hadn't chinked it, but had used rolled-up feed bags to close the gaps until we could chink it properly. Inside the cabin, we had in a corner a bunk bed, and next to it we had a bed that hung from the north wall. The west wall was a table. The south wall was the door in the center of the wall. The southeast corner was a small wood stove, and in the rafter was one skinny plywood plank bed. One night, my brother, the neighbor, and some city friends and I stayed in the cabin. We had played penny poker until about one, and we decided it was time to bunk out. My brother and I decided to share a bunk because we didn't have enough blankets. The city boys were on the top bunk and one in the rafter bed. The neighbor was on the wall bunk. About 30 minutes after we bunked down, something started hitting the northeast corner of the cabin. That's the corner where the bunk bed was. It sounded like an axe chopping at the logs. It didn't scare us at first because we constantly had people showing up to the cabin and we thought one of our friends had shown up and was trying to scare us. And yes, people would show up late at night. They would come after work. Anyway, my brother hollered out to whomever it was asking who it was. He got no reply other than the chopping kept going on. He and the neighbor followed up by... Whoever is out there needs to tell us who it is, because we have guns, and if you don't reply, you could get shot. No reply again. So they signaled me to chamber my pump shotgun, which I did. It was done to get the point across to whomever it was. No reply, just chop, chop, chop. At that time, we became scared. Who's not afraid of a shotgun? We started asking each other if we knew any of our friends that said they were going to come up. We came to no one that we knew of. My brother yelled out to whoever it was that he was going to shoot if they didn't answer it in the count of three. He stuck his rifle barrel between the logs on that corner and counted. After three, he fired one shot. No answer, and the chopping stopped. We listened for maybe 30 minutes or so in silence and heard nothing. So we decided to go back to sleep. Not long after, the chopping started again. At that time, we became upset and threatened to fire again. My brother stuck his rifle back out and fired several shots after counting to three. This time, we heard something for sure. It started walking along the north wall, going west, and then down the west wall, leading to the south end of the cabin where the door was. When we heard the first steps, we became terrified. It was very heavy, and it was two-legged, not four-legged. When it turned the corner and went south toward the door at the end of the cabin, we all jumped from our beds and loaded our guns. And what I saw next, I can still see in my mind to this day. It leaned over from the west side of the door and looked through the 8-inch gap at the top of the door. All of us paused for maybe about 3 seconds and then began firing at the door. The door seemed to disappear. It was riddled with holes. When everyone was reloading, it apparently moved to the east side of the cabin. It smashed down on the tin roof. We unloaded on that wall, we reloaded, and listened the best we could and couldn't hear anything, especially after shooting in a small place. We were terrified and huddled in the center of the cabin, wondering what to do. We stood there for a couple of minutes and decided we needed to leave and get out of there. The only problem was that we only had one four-wheeler with us and two of us walked up to the cabin. We couldn't get all of us on that one four-wheeler. We voted and my brother and I were going to jump on it and ride like a bat out of hell back to the neighbor's house and get the father to come get the other two. 
So we slowly opened the door and spotlighted what we could to see if we saw anything. We looked at the ground to see if we saw any blood, and there was none. We slowly crept out, looking as we went in every direction while making our way to the four-wheeler. Once we got on it, we rode faster than seemed possible. We made it to the house and told his father what had happened, and he grabbed his gun and we jumped in his truck. There's a jeep trail that leads up to the cabin, and when we got there, the others came running out. We told his dad, just take us off the hill, please don't hang around, and he took us all off that hill. This happened about 30 years ago, and to my knowledge, none ever went back up to that cabin again, not even my neighbor's dad. The face I saw looking at us wasn't a bear. I know what bears look like. It was covered in short, dark hair that laid close to the skin. The eyes were big, heavy brow. I don't care if anyone believes me or not. I know what I've seen, and so do the other people that were there. I've heard, several years later, screams and other things coming from the woods behind my parents' home. One of the other neighbors had their cabin hit and stuff carried off from their place at night. Tree knocks have also been heard by several people. The screams I heard sound identical to some I've listened on YouTube and other people's recordings. Very loud and bizarre sounding. I've only been back on those hills a handful of times since my encounter, and it's not a very comfortable feeling. I've told this as best as I can, and I hope it's understandable. Thanks, Heath. Back in the summer of 2002, Ted, his wife Ginny, and their daughter Lauren were camping with Ted's younger brother, Mike, in the forests near Sisters, Oregon. They both had and were scouting the area for deer. On the second day while planning the next day's excursions, Ted remembered a great location where he had camped previously, where there were major game trails going all over the ridge. Mike decided to check out the area the next morning with his wife. The next morning, they all met back at camp, and Mike reported that they had something strange happen while they were up there exploring the game trail. He told Ted that as they were walking, suddenly about 50 yards or so up the trail, they noticed that a 25-foot tree was being shaken violently, but they didn't see anything that could have caused the tree to shake. They both agreed that it must have been a bear, as they were not sure what else it could have been. The next morning, Mike and his wife decided to go back to check it out, while Ted and his family decided to go explore some nearby caves. When they returned to camp, Mike's tent and all their belongings were gone. All that was left was a note saying that they had run into Bigfoot and they were heading home. Mike explained to Ted what happened the next day on the phone after everyone had returned home. He said that they made it up to the tree that was being shaken and they were looking for tracks when he heard some brush rustle toward the top of the hill. When he looked up, a boulder the size of a basketball was flying through the air towards them and landed on the trail right in front of them, shaking the ground as it hit. At that moment, he said that every hair on the back of his neck was standing on end. Before he could say anything to his wife, here comes another rock, similar in size, and this time the boulder landed to their right. He explained that when this happened, fear had taken over, and he could feel his back tense up, and then here comes the third rock landing right there as well. He raised his twenty-two rifle and shot three times over the area where the rocks were coming from, and then he shouted, Is anyone up there? After waiting with no response, Mike had an eerie feeling. He yelled to his wife, Let's get out of here before we die. After talking with his brothers about this experience, a plan was put together to go back to the area soon and find out what the heck was going on. The following Saturday, they loaded for bear. Ted had a 22 mag pistol and a 270 rifle and an Arkansas toothpick, which is actually a big knife. Mike had a 300 Weatherby mag and a 22 mag pistol, as well as a knife, and both of them had pockets full of bullets. They loaded up the Suburban with all their gear, plus their wives and all the kids, and they headed out early Saturday morning. Arriving around 7 a.m., everything seemed normal, very calm, no wind, Birds were chirping, squirrels were playing, and the sun was coming up. Ted and Mike grabbed their guns and headed to the spot where the tree was. They'd made it to the tree and were looking for the rocks, keeping an eye on the ridge where the rocks had come from. And out of nowhere, a violent crash sounded from the exact spot where the rocks had come from last week. It sounded like a tree was being picked up and slammed against another tree. 
Immediately, they were each down on one knee, looking through their scopes, trying to find whatever had just made that noise. Then they noticed that the woods had shut down, with no noise whatsoever. Mike was also scanning the hillside with his rifle, as Ted walked over to him, whispering, What in the world was that? They stood for a few moments in silence, and Ted said to Mike, If it charges, I'm going to kill it. About that time, a second thunderous crash happened again in the same spot. Ted's heart was in his throat and beating like a drum as they both stood scanning the trees with their rifles. Ted looked at Mike and said, Let's walk up there. Let's flush it out in the open. As they started up the hill, the third crash happened. Guns loaded and safeties off, they slowly started walking up the hill toward where they heard the last crash. They got halfway up the hill and suddenly heard the Suburban start up. Fearing the worst, they turned and took off at a dead run to the truck. They arrived in a panic, only to find that their wives and kids had become cold and needed to run the heater. Ted looked at Mike and asked, Do you want to go back up there? And Mike replied, Heck no, my heart cannot take it. They never saw anything, but concluded that their experience was typical Bigfoot behavior, shaking of trees, throwing rocks, whacking sticks. A few years later, in the fall of 2008, Ted, his wife Jenny, and their daughter Lorne, as well as Ted's older brother Travis, had drawn deer tags and were excited for opening day. They arrived Friday evening and set up camp near where they had camped with Ted's older brother a few years earlier. They put their two tents up eight feet apart with a giant tarp that was 30 by 25 feet in the trees about 10 feet up to keep the rain and dew off of them and their supplies. They had plans to stay Friday night until the following weekend, nine days in total. Everything was going great. They were seeing lots of deer passing on, some smaller bucks, and were hoping for bigger ones to appear. On Wednesday evening, after dinner, they decided to play a game of balderdash. It had been a long day as they had risen early and everyone seemed to have giggles, especially Ted and Travis. Let's just say they were all having a great time at hunting camp without a care in the world. They finally decided to go to bed around 10 o'clock. Around 2 a.m., Ted was awakened to heavy footsteps coming toward the camp from his brother's truck that was parked about 100 feet from the camp. It was dead calm out and about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. The ground was crunchy because of the freezing weather. Ted had been sleeping with his 270 Savage Boss on his right side, loaded and ready, while his wife and daughter slept to his left. He first thought that Travis went to his truck for something and was only hearing him come back to camp. As it was walking toward camp, Ted could distinctly hear that it was walking on two legs, and as it was getting closer, he started to hear it breathe. He thought that his brother might have had an upset stomach and must have gone to the truck to get some pills. But as he heard it walking towards camp, it sounded like it stopped at the fire pit. The sound was like Darth Vader breathing, low and deep. Unbeknownst to Ted, his brother was now awake in his own tent, and he was thinking that it was Ted gathering firewood in the middle of the night, and that he was out of breath. As both men were laying there in their separate tents, they realized about the same time what they were dealing with. A Bigfoot. The breathing went on for about 10 to 15 minutes. Ted was thinking that it was spending a lot of time there because of all the odors, and that is where he had been doing all the cooking. He could not get himself out of bed to peek, but remained motionless, listening so intently that he was not thinking of anything else. Then it walked over to Travis's tent and stood right in front of the doorway and remained there for several minutes, still breathing like Darth Vader. It seemed as if he was contemplating what to do next or wondering what he was smelling. Later, Travis remarked that the sound of his breathing seemed to be coming from the part of the tent about seven and a half to eight feet high. Travis never moved a muscle, controlling his breathing and thinking, Crap, I left my gun in my truck. Then they both heard it walk off into the woods, about 50 feet, then it stopped. It was there for quite a while and then started walking again up the hill, and everything went silent. Then, suddenly, they both heard two long, clear calls that sounded like a whoop up the hill in the distance. Soon, the brothers got up and built a huge fire and started talking about the encounter, each telling the other, I thought that was you. When daylight came, they told the girls what had happened and began looking around the area for tracks. 
They didn't find anything, but they realized that they were not leaving tracks either because of the frozen ground, which was littered with pine needles and small rocks. As they were recalling the experience of the previous night, they both agreed that they heard it leave camp and stop about 50 feet out. They all then began to scan the woods to find out what it might have been doing. And then Travis yelled out, I found something. That something ended up to be a giant turd that the Bigfoot had left. Travis looked at it and exclaimed, I've hunted my entire life and I've never seen a turd like this. It was about 12 inches long and 3 to 4 inches around and had pieces of bark and leaves in it. Travis said they should wrap it in foil and put it in the cooler, to which Jenny replied, Oh, hell no. As they stood there that morning, they were in disbelief that they experienced another Bigfoot encounter close to the spot where they had come across him a few years before. Ted remembered reading once that Bigfoot is attracted to laughter and noise. Now he knows they are. Coincidentally, Travis decided to go home later that day. In 2017, Ted and his wife Jenny had purchased elk tags for the Cascade Range in Oregon. They got up early on opening morning, threw all the gear on the truck, and headed out in hopes to bag a couple of bull elk. They decided to begin their day near the Marion Forks on Highway 22 and then travel Sheep Creek to Highway 20. This would provide a full day of hunting and driving. That afternoon, they arrived at Highway 20, and Ted said to Ginny, Well, we have at least one hour of daylight left. If we head to our old deer camp where we had all the Bigfoot activity, we could hunt the last half hour of daylight. Ginny agreed, and as they arrived at the area, the sun was going down and the woods were getting dark. Ted made a turn down a gravel road, and as he was coming out of a corner, he looked down the road about 300 yards. On the left side, he could see something dark black standing just off the side of the road next to some pylons. It looked out of place. It was the only thing black that was close to the edge. He slammed on the brakes and yelled, Virginia, get the binoculars! As he focused the binoculars, he could see the shoulders and the head, but no facial features. It had a cone head. As he was looking at it through the binoculars, it just stepped off the road, and he clearly saw that it walked on two legs. Then he yelled, Hang on! and punched it to get a little closer. They got to where it had been standing, got out to look and listen for a while, but did not hear or see anything. The next morning, he put out two game cameras on that trail, but he captured nothing. The area where they spotted this Bigfoot was about a mile and a half from where they had the midnight visitor, and about three quarters of a mile from where the Bigfoot said, get the hell out, with all the rock throwing and tree shaking. All of these incidents happened in late summer, early fall of the year. The crazy thing about this is the brothers had all heard of Bigfoot while growing up, but didn't really give it much thought until these experiences. It serves to change one's mind about what is out there. Ted's opinion is, it's an ape that walks upright like a human, and that it's nocturnal. It still will move during daylight hours if it needs to. Thanks for listening to our stories, and happy hunting. During the 1970s, Chloe had gone with her father to his logging camp at Detroit Lake in Marion County, Oregon. She was sleeping in a large wooded floored tent in a room of her own. During the night, she was awakened by noise and opened the inner door to the front porch, being separated from it by a full-length screen door. At the other end of the porch, about 15 to 20 feet away, a Sasquatch was standing in front of the open cooler door with a 20-pound piece of meat that had been brought to camp on the preceding day clamped under its arm. The light in the cooler illuminated the creature fully, and she described it as female with normal-sized breasts and reddish-brown short fur. She estimated its height to be about six foot six. The Sasquatch looked at her, but neither of them moved. After some seemingly considerable time, Chloe screamed, to which the Sasquatch did not react. The men in the tent began to jump out of bed, and the Sasquatch left with the meat. The men spilled out onto the porch and followed the receding figure with several flashlights. Its footprints were about 14 inches long. The food in the cooler had obviously been searched through, but was left in rather orderly condition. Previously, a bear had gotten into the same cooler and had made a mess of its contents. Chloe's father had seen a Sasquatch some weeks earlier when it was crossing the road in front of his car headlights just after dusk. It scared him. 
There were many reports of sightings in this area at the time. Although the cooler contained a variety of vegetables and fruits, the Sasquatch selected and kept the meat only. The door to the cooler had been opened in normal fashion by the handle rather than torn off bear fashion. The relaxed response of the Sasquatch to the girl brings up the question of whether a Sasquatch recognizes a human female as such and responds in a different fashion to her, perhaps as a function of the sex alone or different body language conveyed by a woman, or children for that matter. My wife, daughter, and I were towing our trailer up to a local campsite on Saturday, July 3rd, 2004, in the morning for an overnight campout. I was driving along the Prospect Butte Falls Highway. I came around a corner and was slowed down to about 30 miles per hour. As we turned the corner, about 40 yards down the road on the right-hand side, I saw what I thought was a man taking a step from the road into the forest. I clearly saw an arm swing and a leg. What struck me was that it was pitch black from head to toe. I said to my wife, What is that? She said, I don't know. At this point, I'm still thinking that it was a person, but that it was strange. There was a dirt logging road that crossed the highway right where the creature was standing. I started slowing down and expected to see a person or a truck or a camper on the road. As we went by and looked, there was nothing there. We continued down the road and my wife and I talked about what we had seen. My daughter was in the back of the truck and didn't see anything. It all happened very quickly. I did not see anything until it moved as I was preoccupied by driving and towing. My wife saw it standing there by the road before it moved and clearly saw hair and could see both sides of the torso. I kept running over in my mind what it could have been. I've lived in this area all of my life, and I've seen every animal that lives in these woods. This did not fit in any category. The only thing that color is a black bear, and this clearly was not a bear. We finally agreed that it may have been a Bigfoot. We decided to hurry to get to camp and drop the trailer and get back down and look for tracks. I had my camera, and my intention was to find some tracks and get some pictures of them. We went to camp and hurried back to the spot. The time since we went by was about an hour. The logging road turned out to be very dry and hard. I searched all around in the forest and on the other side of the highway for tracks, but couldn't find anything that was clearly a Bigfoot track. I went back to where it was standing in the same spot and was looking up the tree standing there for a bee's nest or something that perhaps a bear might be interested in. I was still trying to eliminate all other possibilities. Then it occurred to me that when I seen this creature step off the road, it had stepped behind some branches on this tree. I looked up and realized that the branches were way above my head. I'm six foot four, and this thing was big. That convinced me. Hi, feel free to share this, but keep in mind there's some very controversial content. I live off the grid in Oregon. My family has had numerous experiences with these beans since we purchased the property in 1988. I grew up hunting and I know the woods and have sharpened my sixth sense more than the average person. Anyone who spends the majority of their time in the woods is able to sharpen that sense. I've hunted cougars and everything else in this part of the continent, never with a guide, always on my own. Anyway, in the last five years, these beings have been coming to the upper canyon of our property and staying from late summer, early fall, and then leaving when winter hits. Except for this year, it seems they have stayed and made it their sanctuary. I've seen so many signs over the years, it's not even a question that they are here. The way we produce electricity is with a hydro plant, and we have two miles of PVC pipe running up and tapped into the creek where we draw the water from. The other day I hiked up to clean out the debris from the pipes so the power would turn back on, and all of a sudden I felt that predatory vibe lasered in on me. My dog was shaking and couldn't wait to get the heck out of there. He's a Rhodesian Ridgeback and weighs 114 pounds. He isn't scared of much, although he is cautious after the encounters we have had. I stood up while I was still in the creek, and I saw a tree being shook. This tree is a decent-sized ash, and I saw this thing behind it shaking it with such force I couldn't believe it. Not only that, but I heard him communicate telepathically that he and his family are pissed off that we're diverting water from the creek. I've grown up around American Indians my whole life, and I've heard the stories of how these beings mind-speak as a way of communication. I really have debated with myself telling this story. 
I have told a few friends what's been going on, and all I get is ridicule. It's such BS. There's really no point in trying to convince them. This is the first time anything like that ever happened. I've called these things in with a Fox Pro Predator call when I was going after a cougar that had killed one of our young horses. At 2 a.m., I heard it give out a very deep growl, not even 30 yards behind me. I wasn't able to see it that time, which has bothered me. Not sure if it had crawled into the call and was laying down there, or they have the ability to not be seen. Also, for the record, no, it was not a bear or cougar. Bears will run right up to the call, and I know what cougars can sound like. The one I saw looked about eight or nine feet tall, four to five feet across the shoulders, and it had reddish-brown hair. His hands were what stood out the most when I saw him gripping and shaking the ash tree. The size of dinner plates come to mind. His fingers didn't have hair, and I could clearly see his yellowish fingernails. Very human-looking. I've heard First Nations talk about how they are another tribe of humans, it's no coincidence that every tribe in North America describes the same thing and the same abilities. Not sure what they are, but I believe it is highly plausible that they are interdimensional. If people were to say this 20 years ago, you'd be laughed at and ridiculed for the rest of your life. So, there it is. Hi. I took a three-day vacation beginning on September the 4th, 2012, from northern Nevada to the southern coast of Oregon. I take professional photos for a website I operate, and I was hoping to get in some great scenic shots before it got too cold and lousy for the rest of the year. My fiancé and I were on a hike, about six or eight miles above Brookings, Oregon, in Curry County. We were on a hiking trail in a densely wooded area, following a trail called the Loop Trail. The trail is about a quarter of a mile past the area called Natural Bridges Viewpoint. We'd gone down the trail without incident, although it was getting dark and I felt as though we needed to hurry to get back, even though there really was no reason to. It was just a feeling like the hairs on the back of my neck had started to stand up. I can't quite explain it. I just suddenly felt uncomfortable. We didn't see any other hikers while we were on our way back up the trail or on the way down. We stopped walking when we heard some loud snaps in the forest around us, like something was breaking tree branches. We looked around but did not see anything at first. We decided to keep walking. When we saw some bushes about 20 yards ahead of us sway back and forth, we stopped again and were then assaulted by a horrific smell that reminded me of garbage baking in the sun. By then, the nervous feeling I had had intensified and I was really beginning to worry about the onset of fog and the fading light. The forest was misty and it was raining lightly. We were climbing a steep part of the trail and I gave it my best push to get to the end of the trail. As we were finishing the final climb, I turned and looked behind me. I'm not sure why. It was like I knew someone was watching, and yet I told myself I was just being silly. When I turned, I saw a head above some tree branches, with the rest of the body obscured by the heavy vegetation. The head was covered in dark, reddish-brown hair, and was impossibly far from the ground. If this was a man, he must have been close to eight feet tall. I blinked a couple of times, convinced I was seeing things. The thing I was looking at did not disappear. Instead, it looked at me curiously for a few seconds, then moved out of my view behind a tree. I grabbed my fiancé's hand, too afraid to tell him what I had seen because I thought he might go looking for it, and then made my way back to our vehicle as fast as I could. I'm not crazy. This was not a trick of light or fog. Something very large, with the face of an ape, was looking at me. I will never forget it. Welcome to November, everyone. The Bigfoot Case Files channel has another prize giveaway contest. Same as last month, just listen to the video linked on your screen and follow the rules to enter. Good luck!